Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. As we've been making this mad dash through the Bible book by book, uh, we are now going to start in the book of Ephesians. And uh, Ken has asked that I read a portion from Ephesians 4, and starting with verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine or by trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plottings, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. It's supposed to be all put together. Yes. So, in the book of Ephesians, and we're going to find out that it's very closely related to the book of Colossians, we find a number of surprising things. There are many scholars who regard Ephesians as the, the best book of Paul, the, the queen of Paul's writings. Now, hopefully, by the time we get, get done discussing it, you may have some idea why they think of that, think that way. Ephesians, of course, was written, uh, as we will discover later, uh, from prison. Paul had a time to sit down, not, unlike some of his earlier writings, which he was busy on the, on the road, and he was preaching, and he was doing a million things, and he's sort of scratching off a letter real quick to some friends. Now he's in Roman prison. He's, he thinks that there are some hints that he's going to get out of prison pretty soon. So he's writing three books, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And these three books are going to be carried by a couple of people, Tychicus and Onesimus, back to their churches to which they were addressed. A little bit later, he's going to write Philippians, and then he's actually going to get out of prison for a period of time. So that's sort of where we are. Uh, chronologically with the book of Ephesians. You if know, you, oh, Go ahead. What Norm read about the working of the church and how the church is to work together as one body mm -hmm. just reminds me of what Ellen White said, for our body, she said perfect circulation is perfect health. Mm -hmm. And in the church too, if we have perfect, perfect circulation, everything is operating, uh, everything's getting nourished, everything is operating at uh, capacity, mm -hmm. then the church has perfect health too. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciated her comment, perfect circulation is perfect yeah. health. Well, Ephesians start out, starts out by saying, from Paul, who by God's will is an apostle of Christ Jesus to, the people, to God's people and my version says in Ephesus, but the earliest versions don't have in Ephesus. They say to God's people who are faithful in their life in union with Christ Jesus. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but suffice it to say that many scholars have looked at this and concluded that this letter 
written to the church at Ephesus. Remember, Paul spent more time in Ephesus than any other church with the possible exception of his home church, which was Antioch in Syria. He spent more than three years with these people in Ephesus. He should have had lots and lots of friends. Looking at the book of Romans, the whole last chapter, he's greeting this person and that person, this person and that person, and he had never even been to Rome. But here in Ephesians, you come to the end of Ephesians, there are no greetings to anybody. How can that be? Well, the conclusion is that this was a letter that was supposed to be circulated among the various churches in, in Asia Minor, not just to the Ephesians, but to all the churches. And that's why Paul didn't particularly... Some people have called this the most anonymous letter uh, in all of Paul's writings. But he goes on about spiritual blessings, and the first major thing that we seem to come to, it starts with uh, verse 7 of chapter 1. And let's just look at this. This is a pretty major issue. Um, actually, let's start back with verse 5. Because of his love, God had already decided that through Jesus Christ, now this is Paul's giving advice and counsel to all the Christian churches, that through Jesus Christ he would make us his children. This was his pleasure and purpose. Let us praise God for his glorious grace, for the free gift he gave us in his dear Son. For by the blood of Christ we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God which he gave to us in such large measure. The word charis, meaning grace, has two parts to it. We know, and we still use, we still have to use the word grace to mean both parts. When we say graceful, what do we mean? Something is lovely, it's beautiful, it, it maybe moves in a nice, smooth way, right? Graceful. That's one aspect of the word grace. The other part is uh, free. Uh, um, we, we say grace when we're, when, when we're praying. It's a respect to God. It means, uh, it means actions of a person who is very kind and loving and respectful. Okay? So it has those two parts to it. Uh, which he gave to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. What do you suppose he had in mind when he mentioned the secret plan? The yeah. Greek, the Greek, just to give you a clue, is musterion, the word from which we get the word mystery. Well, there were the mystery religions of the day that you there were secrets in the society, and you had to be initiated in various ways to know the secret to join the society. Pay a lot of money and yeah. go through a lot of ceremonies and so forth, and eventually you might get to know these insider secrets that made you a part of the in-group, so you were an insider and all those other people out there were outsiders. Do we ever use those kind of The mystery terminal? of how the creator of the universe could come down, empty himself, and die down here as a human is a mystery that is not like the mystery of religions, but it's, it's a thing that we cannot comprehend in its fullness. Mm -hmm. And we're told that we're going to spend eternity. Mm -hmm. And the angels love to look into that mystery. Mm -hmm. That's what the mystery we're talking about. You're speaking of something the Bible calls the mystery of godliness. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Well, the interesting thing is, whereas the mystery religions were very close-lipped about what their mystery was, what does Paul say they're going to do? He's going to tell everybody. God has this super secret, and I'm going to tell everybody. It's, he, was, he was poking the It wasn't, wasn't part of the super secret was that God had planned all this since before yeah. the creation of the yeah. world yeah. and that Jesus Christ would come and die on the cross for our sins. Well, notice what he goes on to say. This plan, this secret plan we've been talking about, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together. That would be unity, that would be togetherness, that would be oneness, right? everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. Uh, what needs to be brought together in heaven? That's where the distinction started. The angels in heaven, the creatures from the other world in heaven, 
uh, we're all going to be one big happy family. Aren't they one big happy family now? In heaven? In heaven? I think they're quite disturbed because one third of their angels um, are down here being demons and they uh -huh. used to be close friends with uh, the other angels up in heaven. And, and, and what does that tell us? That uh, Why evil, would the angels be disturbed by that? That, that their friends became demons? Their friends believe, yeah. believe Satan and uh, mm -hmm. why would they be disturbed by that? Mm. I mean, does that mean, does that mean that maybe some of the angels who are on God's side might still have some questions about him? Yes. Or did it, have some questions about questions him? Questions on what is happening here? Mm -hmm. why, why is all this happening? Mm -hmm. One third of the angels participated in open rebellion probably many of the other two-thirds had questions mm -hmm. that weren't answered until the cross. Look over at chapter 3. We'll come back and look at some things and more things in chapter 1 later. But look over at Ephesians chapter 3 and also go to verse 7. And Paul says some more things about this secret plan and what, might, might, what it might imply. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people. Uh, do we believe that? Paul was certainly the least of all the apostles, right? Nope. Well, in his heart, because he had something to do with the persecution of the church. Mm -hmm. But, you know, God, God doesn't see those types of things once he forgives you. Okay. So it's a, that's a struggle within Paul also. I think we're told that the closer we get and understand the holiness and what God's character is like, the worse we look in our own eyes. Yeah. And that goes on until we're saved. Yes. Until, yes. until his third coming or second yeah. coming. Now, isn't the fact that we feel bad, we feel that we're not as we should, doesn't, isn't that evidence that the Holy Spirit is talking to us and wanting us to improve? I hope it's not just a case of feeling bad. I hope it's a case of our recognizing the truth about ourselves mm. and turning to God and saying, God, I know you're the only one who can do anything about this. Please come and do everything you can with me. Mm -hmm. I think you showed the difference between a logical thinking person and an emotion yeah. uh, person because you said more thinking and I'm saying more feeling, but I do believe it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, reading on, more of verse 8 here in Ephesians chapter 3. I, I'll read the first part again. I am less than the least of all God's people, Paul speaking, yet God gave me this privilege of taking the, to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ. He calls himself the, God, the apostle to whom? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. The good, uh, uh, and of making all people see how God's secret plan that's the mystery again, is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church. Now, who would that include? Us. All of us. All of us. By means of the church, what's going to happen? The angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. What could the angels in heaven, now we're not talking about the evil angels now, we're talking about the good angels. What could the good angels possibly learn about God from us? How God uh, works with sinful people to transform them from the inside out, mm -hmm. create a clean heart in them, and the angels never knew God wanted to do that or had that in him because there was no need for it before um, the rebellion in heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they knew, they experienced what God is like and one-to-one -one and that sort of thing. But that, God's other side, or not the other side, but the side they couldn't see was how God would deal with rebellion. Mm -hmm. And only through the experiment with sin and which involves us do they become more aware of you know, the magnitude of God's love. 
sometimes it's the same for us human beings. We really don't know someone, and when we see them in a crisis or maybe a war situation and how gallant people help and stuff, then we really know the person, the depths of his character. And maybe the good angels really are finding out the depths of God's character as, he see, as they see their God in this war and how he's handling himself. And, and in verse 11 it says, according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, in some ways, uh, probably watching humanity going through what it's going through is kind of a replay for them also about themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I really think so because um, it's just, it's looking at themselves from a different angle, I think, mm -hmm. because we don't know all what happened during the war in heaven and how all that came to be. And we, all, we have a lot of wars here on earth mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of information they're probably getting from us. There's another couple of verses that fit with these verses we read so far, and then I want to compare some few things from Ellen White. Look at Colossians now. It turns out that Colossians and Ephesians were written very at the same time, basically. There are actually 55 verses in these two short books that are verbatim. 55 of those verses are exactly the same in Ephesians as they are in Colossians. But now look at Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 19. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. And he's just ex finished explaining how Jesus was actually the creator of the world. And to fit with what you said a little while ago, Joanne, uh, we need to, if we're going to understand Jesus and what kind of a person he is, we need to understand not only his work in the Gospels when he came here and lived as a human being, we need to recognize what he did all through the Old Testament, just as he said because he was the God of the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and, and other places. Luke uh, 24, 44. He was the God of the Old Testament. So now, he, God is, uh, Paul has said, we need to recognize he is the creator of all things. Now he's going to say, it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. He's completely and fully God. Through the Son then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his son's blood, that's, another, that's a code word for his sacrificial death, on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. Okay, now my question, we talk about this fairly often here, but it's something that very few other groups are talking about, so maybe we're spending more time on it than we should, but maybe that brings things a little bit more into balance. What could possibly be a benefit to the angels to the plan of salvation here on this earth? I mean, we need forgiveness. We need all kinds of help. What do, they need? What do the angels need? The angels need to see sin and the results of sin, don't they? Clarity. Clarity. Okay. Well, let me, let me read you a couple of words, and, and let's see if this will help us. This would be... Uh, Signs of the Times, February 13, 1893, the words from Ellen White. Through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. Larger purpose than the redemption of this earth? Through the government, I'm sorry, through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe the charge of Satan refuted, the nature and result of sin made plain, and the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. So what's going to happen as a result of this demonstration that's being given here on this earth? God is going to be known better. God mm -hmm. is going to reveal parts of his personality and character that were never revealed before. And his government. And How his government operates is going to be more clearly spelled out, isn't it? Satan had declared that the law of God was faulty and that the good of the universe demanded a change in its requirement. Of course, if you can change God's law, then who's hoping to get back into heaven? Well, isn't God's law like gravity? You can't change gravity. God's law is a natural process law. 
that it's not arbitrary that he just says, don't kill. It, it's actually when you kill, you are harming yourself and, and, and sin then is killing you. So I, I've heard that God's law is like gravity. It's, it's, God is trying to explain that this is how things are mm -hmm. in, in my government. This is how they yeah. are. Maybe I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I got the idea from what you said, uh, Gary, that, that maybe there was something in the uh, contest uh, between the angels that brought up something that uh, we don't know about. It seems to me that this it pretty much says that their education is about God and it came by what he did in this environment, not in that environment up there. Yes. Yeah, but it is transferable to their environment. Sure, it's law. Well, that's kind of what I was saying. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. So, reading on, in attacking the law, he, Satan, thought to overthrow the authority of its author and gain for himself the supreme allegiance. That was Signs of the Times, February 13, 1893. In another place, Christ object lesson, Christ's Object Lessons, page 167, paragraph 1, the work of Satan as an accuser began in heaven. This has been his work on earth ever since man's fall, and it will be his work in a special sense as we approach nearer to the close of this world's history. As he sees that his time is short, he will work with greater earnestness to deceive and destroy. He is angry when he sees the people on the earth who in their weakness and sinfulness have respect to the law of Jehovah. He is determined that they shall not obey God. He delights in their unworthiness and has devices prepared for every soul that all may be ensnared and separated from God. He seeks to accuse and condemn God and all who strive to carry out his purposes in this world in mercy and love, in compassion and forgiveness. And then this one, which is particularly telling, I think, Patriarchs and Prophets 68 and 69, but the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligence of the other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. She intentionally left the word men out, which was supplied in the King James Version. That's John 12, 31 and 32. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and results of sin. What would have happened if that would have never happened? If the justification of the law or justification of Jesus had never happened in the eyes of the universe? Well, if it never happened, God would prove to be a liar and then the whole government, the whole universe, as far as I'm concerned, would fall apart because you can't trust him. So, you're saying then that um, his salvation not only saved us, but it saved the universe also. That's right. Okay. That's right. Well, you know, Jesus not only created the whole universe and earth, he created salvation for everybody. And then we... Um, sinful, corrupt people that we are, are to witness to this. I mean, God is entrusting so much to us humans, us stumbling humans, his, um, his majesty and, and Christ, you know, that, mm. I, I don't know, it's, it's overwhelming to me that we are to be a witness. Yeah. The heavenly beings that suffered the situation of the war in heaven, they needed to see what's been going on here for the last several thousand years. That's well, what helped. And there's two things they need to see. They need to see what happens when Satan more is more or less in control. And we, we realize that as this 
Earth's history draws to a close, God is going to sort of withdraw himself more and more and let Satan have more and more influence on events here on this earth. And the universe is going to be looking on and seeing what would happen if Satan were in charge. And it may be, it may be that the angels in heaven are still suffering a bit as well, they watch as they watch us oh, yeah, sure. suffering it it must pain them if, to if, see us suffer if they do things that are in the right way sure they would well if it's as significant as you say it is that explains why they're looking onto the this earth so exactly. so hard first, yeah. i mean why they're so motivated to watch what's going on first corinthians 4 9 and i and i repeat for it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, Paul again is, and is, is speaking those humble words, like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle, the Greek word is theatron, the, from which we get our word theater, as a spectacle for the whole world of angels and of human beings. The first thing he mentions is what? Angels. The apostles are a spectacle to angels. Let me, let, me, let me just add a few more things from Ellen White. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus is to reveal God to whom? The angels. To angels. How can that be? Not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme in which angels desire to look. And look at that passage in 1 Peter 1, verse 12. 1 Peter 1, verse 12. Can you imagine our world being a lesson book? I mean, it would have explosions going off. It would have this and that. It would be the most lively book. Yeah. <laughs> 1 Peter 1, verse 12. God revealed to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours, as they spoke about those things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. And it will be their study through endless ages. Desire of Ages, page 19. So this is, these ideas are not just obscure places. I've now read from Patriarchs and Prophets, and I just read from Desire of Ages. Are we going to go up to heaven and talk to the angels about how it was here? Exactly. Well, they've been seeing it for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and they, have seen, they have seen both sides playing out. See, we don't see either side. of We don't see the good angels. We don't see the evil angels. We just see the results of what's happening here on this earth. But they look on, even, even on the death of Christ, as we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in a moment, they look on that and they saw what Satan was doing, they saw what his angels were doing, they saw what God was doing, they saw what God's angels were doing. They saw both sides in mortal conflict through that whole experience. And it was an incredible revelation to them. When happening it, here. When it was very, very dark, could they see? Yes, oh yes, they, they clearly can So this lesson book not only showed the good, but it was X-rated, it was R-rated, it was, it was violence, it was everything. Yeah. They saw everything. Yeah, so we're going to talk about some more of this when we come back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We are discussing a point which few Christians seem to have any knowledge of. And I'm going to read another quotation from Desire of Ages talking about how the angels and the rest of the universe are involved in one way or another in observing what's going on in the plan of salvation here. We read from Ephesians 1 verses 7 through 10, 3 verses 7 through 10, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20 to suggest that God is trying to teach the angels something about himself through the church. That's us. And I quote, this is Desire of Ages, page 758. To the angels in the unfallen worlds that cry, it is finished. When was that cry made? At the cross. At the cross, as Christ is dying, right? It is finished had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. So many of our Christian friends and many within our church feel like the whole purpose of Christ coming and living and dying was to earn our salvation, to pay the price for our redemption. But here, Ellen White says very clearly, it wasn't just for us, it was for the entire universe. universe. And I read on. Not until the death of Christ was through character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The arch apostate had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Now we think that the angels are so clear about everything. They live in the very presence of God. They've got everything figured out. Well, let me read a couple more passages. Um, we're really focusing on this, but I, it's an important point, I think. It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption that Christ bore the penalty on behalf of the human race. And this time she says, it was for their benefit only. The throne of justice, that would be God's throne, right? Throne of righteousness, justice, must be eternally and forever made secure, even though the race, that would be all of us, the human race, be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. In other words, God had to demonstrate the truth about himself even if not a single human being joined him in trying to accomplish that. Do we read that anywhere in the Bible? It's right in Romans 3, verse 4. You must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. And earlier in that verse, he says, verse 3, but, if, but what if some of them were not faithful? That is, he was talking about the Jews. He could just as well have been talking about us. Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly, the God, certainly not. God must be true even though all human beings are liars. As the scripture says, you know, may you be shown to be right in what you, when you take your well, case. When you say, you may you be shown to be right, that means may God be shown to be right. That's not talking about us. No, it's talking about God. He's speaking to God there. So, by the sacrifice Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled, and the human race, remember we said the race, the human race, would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the unfallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. Who is able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on earth? Remember we talked about this a moment ago. His trial in the judgment hall, his crucifixion. Who saw all of that? Who witnessed these scenes, she says? The heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan and his angels. Mm -hmm. Signs of the Times, July 12, 1899. So when the angels in heaven saw their God come down to earth, being a little baby growing up and dying on a cross, they were their mouths were absolutely stopped because they couldn't believe that God would go to that extent uh, and love sinful human beings that much. Mm -hmm. Now I got a, a question. Jaw dropper. A jaw dropper. You started out by saying that that Satan was so clever, so fool. He he fooled them. Mm -hmm. um, 
Was it really that he was clever and fooled him and had all kinds of tricky things to, to fool him and confuse him? Or was it because they hadn't been exposed to this stuff before and it was they were kind of being led by him or led by the ideas of him that needed to be rectified? Oh, he, probably he, some of that too. Some he, of that. Too. He appealed to selfishness. Mm -hmm. God lied to you? He's holding out on you? Why, if you do what I tell you, you'll live in a higher existence. You'll, you'll become as God. Mm -hmm. He just appealed to what we so often succumb to. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a, a matter of fact, on the... Uh, but but isn't that what we're all looking for anyway? Looking for? To a higher existence? Aren't we tr moving towards uh, God to... to to um, get closer to him, and the he is the highest existence. The mechanism is what is at issue. Not trying to get to a higher existence, the mechanism, follow me, do what I tell you, distrust but how do you God. you know what the mechanism is good, which mechanism is bad? That's what I've been saying. That's, that's you need to go on. through all this stuff so you can tell one yeah. mechanism over another. Yep. That's exactly right, and, and because they didn't know that, there is room for a savior. Let, let, let me demonstrate that once again, not by my words or my arguments, but by, from the writings of Ellen White. These are, these are passages that not many people know about. This one is found in, was originally in Ellen White's diary. It became part of the um, Ellen White 1888 materials, page 569, paragraph two and three over to the top of 570. For centuries, God bore with the inhabitants of the old world, but at last guilt reached its limit. He came out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth and by a flood cleanse the earth of its iniquity. Notwithstanding this terrible lesson, men had no sooner begun to multiply once more than the rebellion and vice became widespread. And what's the evidence for that? What happened right after, yeah, the Tower of Babel, right after the flood. It was hardly even, you know, time for a few people to be born and bang they're already rebelling right uh, the time came that a change must uh, I'm sorry notwithstanding this terrible lesson men no sooner began to multiply once more than rebellion vice became widespread Satan seemed to have taken control of the world the time came that a change must be made or the image of God would be <coughs> wholly obliterated from the hearts of the beings he had created that would be here on this earth wouldn't it all heaven watched the movements of God with intense interest. What are they looking for? Would he once more manifest his wrath? Would he destroy the world by fire? The angels thought that the time had come to strike the blow of justice when lo to their wondering vision was unveiled the plan of salvation. Incredible. Another spot, this one is found in Review and Herald, July 17, 1900, paragraphs 4 to 6, and there's part of it is in Desire of Ages, page 37. For centuries, God looked with patience and forbearance upon the cruel treatment given to his ambassadors. At his holy law, prostrate, despised, trampled underfoot, he swept away the inhabitants of the Noachian world with a flood. But when the earth was again peopled, men drew away from God, renewed their hostility to him, manifesting bold defiance. Those whom God rescued from Egyptian bondage followed in the footsteps of those who preceded them. Cause was followed by effect. The earth was being corrupted. So now where are we in history? In history? Farther on down the trail. Okay, now where God is trying to establish his own people in the land of Palestine, isn't he? That's where we are now. They've been rescued from Egyptian bondage. A crisis had arrived in the government of God. All heaven was prepared at the word of God to move to the help of his elect. One word from him. Now these are the angels thinking about what God will do. One word from him and the bolts of heaven would have fallen upon the earth filling with fire and flame. You know, their idea was, God, get rid of those sinners. <laughs> you kind did of, it once. Let's yeah, get up a windstorm. Kind of like... Uh, <laughs> Jonah, a yeah. little bit. Yeah, exactly. That wasn't God's plan, though. God had but to speak 
and there would have been thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and destruction. The heavenly intelligences, these are the good angels, were prepared for a fearful manifestation of almighty power. Every move was watched with intense anxiety. The exercise of justice was expected. The angels looked for God to punish the inhabitants of the earth. The heavenly universe was amazed at God's patience and love. To save fallen humanity, the Son of God took humanity upon himself. Review and Herald, July 17, 1900. So they were willing to send thunderbolts and burn up the earth, mm -hmm. and God appeared as a baby. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they were shocked. The question I got is, if God would have done that, if he did that, could heaven be restored after he did that kind of thing? Well, the angels would have felt that's the way God acts. When you get out of line enough, <laughs> but well, wouldn't there be God a says. wouldn't yeah just do what God says yeah. doesn't it or else kind of or else worship out or of fear else. yeah out of right fear. Yeah. but they were all agreed with it at that time but how about through the countless ages when things come up when you know are are do we really have freedom or not or is the yeah. Lord going to turn on us you know and, and that's why we went through this right yeah they didn't know. They didn't know the depth of God's love. And only know. down here could he show what it was. Yeah. But at the yeah. same time, he was showing that sin had to be put down at some point. Yeah. Because it kept coming back. Well, he kept the put, standing them back up again. After the flood, you know, they just went back to sin. You know, when, when Israel rose... Look how many times they went back to sin. The issue is how it's put down. That's right. That's right. The issue is how it's put down. And the, the true how it's put down could only be demonstrated in his love. You know, Christ said at the cross, instead of destroying the earth, he says, as I be lifted up, I'm going to draw all to me. And so God's method was to draw all to him rather than destroy all. And that's the miracle of miracles, as defined in Education 172. Souls that have borne the likeness of Satan have been transformed into the image of God. This change is itself the miracle of miracles. A change wrought by the Word is, it is one of the deepest mysteries of the Word. We cannot understand it. We can only believe. As declared by the scriptures, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We've got some other things we need to cover in the book of Ephesians, but if you're interested in more, and, and you found this an interesting little discussion, particularly from the writings of Ellen White and the scriptures, there's a handout, several of them on this subject, it at our website, theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You can find it in the miscellaneous materials there. One talk, talks about the great controversy in Scripture, another talks about the plan of salvation and the setting of the great controversy. You'll find them very interesting reading. I'd like to ask you now to turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look at some of the other things in the book of Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 1. 13, and you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. What's God's stamp of ownership? It says um, the Holy Spirit in you, but how are we to know that? Yeah. Kind of like the seal, isn't it? It says seal, uh, the RSV says seal. Yeah, the, the RSV the says Spirit. seal. Don't we, don't we think that the seal of God is something important that's going to happen near the end of this earth's history? Well, the seal does have an identifying mark on it. It, it identifies something as belonging to God. Mm -hmm. Well, look at, compare Ephesians 4, verse 30. And do not make God's Holy Spirit sad, for the Spirit is God's mark of ownership on you, a guarantee that the day will come when God will set you free. So who is going to be 
is going to have that mark on them, that mark that, that says they are the faithful ones, they are the ones who are, who are God's true people? It's going to be the... The so church, cool. the true church. Yeah. Well, it's going to be the ones with the Holy Spirit in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look now at Ephesians chapter 2. Let's pick a couple of spots there. Um, Paul is talking about building up the church, how we can all be one in Christ. And he comes down to verse 19. So then you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now citizens together with God's people and members of the family of God. That's what the Judaizers were so unhappy about. He was making it just as easy for a Gentile to become a Christian as it was for a Jew. You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. Now, our Roman Catholic friends take Matthew 16, and from that they say that Peter is the rock on which the church is built, and, and he's given the keys, etc. Well, if you look at Matthew 18, we don't have time to turn over there right now, but in Matthew 18 it says those keys were given to all of the disciples. And here it says, who's the chief cornerstone? Christ. Jesus. Christ. Jesus Christ. We should say, if people say, we believe the church is built on Peter, we should say, amen, it is built on Peter. And, and, but of course, Jesus himself was the chief cornerstone. It's built on Peter and James and John and et cetera, et cetera, and all the prophets. It's, the church is built on the scriptures, the Bible. That's what, that's the basis for which we have a church. Without it, we wouldn't have a church. And not only that, what else does it say? You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets. Every one of us is supposed to be a part of this building that's being built, this, this body of Christ that's represented by a church, and all of us are supposed to be part of that. It, it gets rather confusing today because there are so many churches. Mm -hmm. And which one has the foundation? Yeah. I want to come back to the verses Paul, I'm sorry, Paul, the verses that Norm read back at the beginning, he was reading from Paul, Ephesians chapter 4. There's some very interesting verses there. Let's see if we can now, in light of what we've learned about Ephesians, what we can conclude. I'm going to start with verse 7 in Ephesians 4. Each one of us has received a special gift in proportion to what Christ has given. As the scripture says, when he went up to the high, very heights, he took many captives with him. He gave gifts to people. Now, what does he went up mean? It means that first he came down to the lowest depths of the earth. And down to the lowest depths would be what? The grave. Phillips, Philip says he died the death, even the death of a common criminal. You can't get much lower than that, right? So the one who came down is the same one who went up above and beyond the heavens to fill the whole universe. Notice this once again. Paul keeps coming back, the whole universe, with his presence. It was he who gave gifts to people. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people. Now, if we had time, we would look at 1 Corinthians 12 and some other places where it suggests that Every one of us is supposed to be a part of the body of whom? Christ. Of Christ. We're all supposed to be. Some of us may be, the word prophet means an ambassador, a representative of God, one who speaks on God's behalf. Uh, an apostle is one who's sent out to, to tell the truth. An evangelist, of course, is someone who tells the good news. So we can see how pastors and teachers, we can say how this all, all fits together. And what's the purpose? And so we shall all come together, verse 13, to that oneness, that unity. The New English Bible says, the unity which is inherent in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer Become, uh, no longer be children carried by the winds and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up and in every way to Christ who is the head. But I thought Christ himself said we were supposed to be like little children. 
I have a question. In our faith. Well, isn't this talking about faith too? It's supposed to be like little children in that we have a capacity to learn. We're supposed to be mature okay. and what, perfect. What's the most important capacity of a child? The most important ca characteristic of a child? Grow. His ability to grow. If he doesn't grow physically, we become very alarmed. If he doesn't grow mentally, we're panicked. If he doesn't grow socially, we think, oh yeah, it's too bad, something's wrong here. If he doesn't grow spiritually, you're supposed to say, isn't that sweet, isn't that nice? <laughs> no, we're supposed to grow up. Huh? Just a child. He's just a child. I have a question here. Yes. In verse 11, he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. That's five things. Mm -hmm. Now, is that saying that if we're church members, we're to be one of those five? Or are there other things that we can be in the church? There are other, other positions that we can be as, as spelled out in 1 Corinthians 12, for example. Oh, okay. But so these are the main ones. These are the main ones, okay. Yeah. So Paul is saying, look, there's a church to be built up. There's a church to have that needs more people to be bricks in that church. And finally he concludes in verse 16, under his control, that would be Christ's control, all the different parts of the body fit together. And the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. So we can see that in the book of Ephesians, Paul keeps coming back to the idea that the church here is to be built up. It's supposed to teach us something about God and about his his universal family, really. Um, but in the few minutes we have left, I'd like to talk, uh, like to touch on a couple other things. What do we do with Ephesians five? Um, let's start with verse eighteen. Do not get drunk with wine, with which you only ruin, which will only ruin you, but instead be filled with the Spirit. But I thought wine was called spirits. Different spirit. Different, <laughs> different spirit? <laughs> What's different it about says, it? It says, Paul is here speaking especially about the drunken orgies commonly associated with many pagan worship ceremonies of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or he or says, filled with the Holy Spirit. We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what, what happens is to be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with the words of psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing hymns and psalms to the Lord with praise in your hearts. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, always give thanks for everything to God the Father. Paul says we must distinguish in every way we possibly can between the worship that happens in our churches and those pagan ceremonies that go on around us. It says in here, true communion with God is not induced by drinking alcohol and drunkenness, no. but by the Holy Spirit. So people actually thought if they drank and got drunk, they had a closer communion with God? Well, remember, we, we say that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace. I mean, alcohol is called joy juice by the Indians. You know, it, they, they, you know, they're hugging each other and people are drunk. They think everything is love and joy and peace. Of course, they lose their self-control, but... Well, God wants a logical, intellectual love. And well, there's a difference there between worships. Mm -hmm. Pulling a difference there. Yeah. Um, do women have it, anything to do with that? Well, it's interesting that the next thing he talks about is wives and husbands. He says, submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. How are we supposed to submit ourselves to the Lord? Well, for a husband has authority over his wife, just as Christ has authority over the church, and Christ is himself the Savior of the church's body. And so wives must submit themselves completely to their husbands, just as the church submits itself to Christ. You know, husbands model themselves after Christ. I, you know, I, I haven't noticed that the church has been doing really good at submitting itself to Christ. <laughs> but then it goes on, nor, what does it say next? Women, women nowadays hate that word submit. Yeah. They want to throw it out of the dictionary. Yeah. But Husband. notice uh, Ken just read verse 21. Mm -hmm. Submit to one another 
mm -hmm. out of reverence for Christ. Right before the verse, many want to throw out. Yeah. Yep. And then verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. He did this to dedicate the church to God by his word after making it clean by washing it in water and, and so forth. Um, Paul recognized in this book, which he's writing around to all the churches, he recognized that he, he, he's hoping to get out of prison. He's hoping to be back there among, among these churches and preach. And he, in fact, he did get a chance for another couple of years to go back there and work among them, traveling as fast as he could from place to place. So hopefully the authorities wouldn't be able to catch up with him. But they finally did, and you know what happened. He went back to prison. Uh, while back in prison that time, he finally wrote his uh, second Timothy, which we'll come to a little bit later. And then, of course, eventually his head was chopped off by a Roman axe as a Roman citizen uh, because he couldn't be crucified or any other evil thing like that because he was a Roman citizen. So here in Ephesians we see, and by the way, we should say one more thing before we leave the family thing. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Children, it is your Christian duty to obey your parents, for this is the right thing to do. Respect your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise added, so that all may go well with you, and you may live a long time in the land. Fathers, then, do not provoke your children yes. to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Yes, exactly. So what, it, what we're seeing here is a mutual respect. Now, in, in the book of Ephesians, and we haven't had a chance to touch nearly all of it, but in the book of Ephesians, we have seen that God, God, Paul, and we're in cooperation with God, is soaring with his, with his thinking to include the entire universe. He's, he's recognized that even the angels had questions. Even the angels had problems. They didn't understand God. They needed to understand how God would deal with this rebellion here on this earth. They needed to understand how loving and kind, how incredibly gracious God is, even when we rebel in Him, even when we spit in His face. Incredible as that may seem. You may find the reading of this material more enlightening, I hope, because of our discussion. We would encourage you to go over and look at those materials at our website if you have an opportunity. And hope it will, hopefully it will give you a new appreciation for the book of Ephesians and Colossians, which we'll talk about later. See you next time.